everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online for tonight's event, A Love Letter to New York City, 2021 Open City Fellows Final Reading, featuring this year's fellows, Aisha Buyan, Aisha Islam, Jessica Jacolby, Teresa Matthew, and Leila Yunus. This event is presented by the Asian American Writers Workshop. We are thrilled to have here with us Hannah Bay, a 2019 Open City Fellow to moderate a discussion with the fellows after the reading. My name is Noel Pangilinan. I am a senior editor at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one. We organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers. We run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color and also publish an award-winning online literary magazine, The Margins. This year, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary with the campaign we launched earlier this month, AAWW at 30. AAWW at 30 will explore the values and ideas that lie at the heart of the workshop's mission. From the need for an artistic home to interrogating our editorial and archival legacies, this campaign will serve not only as a retrospective of our rich and layered history, but also as a resounding call to envision our future. Programs like this wouldn't be possible without the support of our community. You can donate to support many more years of the workshop and all of our programs at the link in the Zoom chat. And we hope you'll find us online as we continue to celebrate this fall. You can also visit aaww.org or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube where the recording of this event will be posted. During this event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat, comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. Let me introduce our fellows. Aisha Buyan is a program manager by day and a writer by night. Her work has been published on Forbes, Brand Voice, and featured on Susan Skog's book, Your Voice Matters, Stand Up, Speak Out. Asia Islam currently works for the Urban Institute, an economic and social policy research organization. Her writing has been recognized at the regional and national level through competitions hosted by Scholastic and Penguin Random House. Jessica Jacobi is a freelance journalist and researcher from Brooklyn, her work has been featured in Vice, Catapult, JSTOR, and other online publications. Teresa Matthew is a writer, photojournalist, and illustrator based in Brooklyn. She presently works as a fact checker at The New Yorker. Her photography and writing have appeared in BuzzFeed Reader, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Leila Yunes is a data journalist and writer based in Brooklyn. She works on data-driven and environmentally focused investigations for ProPublica's local reporting network. She is a professor at the CUNY's Newmark School of Journalism. And our moderator for the night, Hannah Bay. Hannah Bay is an alumna of the Open City Fellowship of the Asian American Writers Workshop. A freelance journalist and nonfiction writer, she is the 2020 nonfiction winner of the Rona Jaff Writers Award. She is also a 2021 Peter Taylor Fellow for the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop. Please join me in welcoming the 2021 Open City Fellows on screen to read. So I decided to read my little love letter to New York as I wrap up my fellowship for the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, I just thought it'd be fitting given that it's about New York. Right before my 21st birthday came, my cousin and I planned a nine day trip across Europe to celebrate the end of college. Every day leading up to the month of the trip, we would send each other a new place, a new restaurant, 
that we wanted to try and talk for hours, meticulously scheming about what to eat in Barcelona, to where we'd wear on the gondola ride in Venice. It was so exciting. A few days before the trip, however, her visa application was rejected. And all of a sudden, I was planning to go to Europe alone. I was sad for her, anxious for myself, and people kept referencing scenes from the movie Taken. And that's how I began my first solo trip. But for the first time, I chose to be with my own thoughts, and everything I knew about solitude changed. Here's a journal entry from August 8, 2017. Casa de San Felipe Neri, Barcelona. This is the most comforted I've felt in a while, leaning against what feels like a trash can covered in graffiti, listening to an older man play a French song on his guitar in the middle of the courtyard. I took years of French and I still have no clue what he's saying, but we shared a glance and he gave me a soft nod and I feel more connected to this man's voice than anything around me. Four years living in various cities and many solo trips later, I could no longer wait to book the next one. I was living another person's life for a few days, meeting people and eating food I'd never experienced before. But most of all, I was comfortable with my thoughts. It was more than comfortable, I sought it out. Solitude recharged my batteries and I journaled extensively. I would take pictures of places and get disappointed because images just did no justice. So in my journals, I began to describe where I was, the animated conversations around me, the bead of sweat trickling down my back and every single thing that would help savor this moment forever. I also reflected on myself. This was dedicated time I took out of my life as a break to refocus. I wrote about my con connection with God, my goals, how I was tracking towards those goals, and if they were consistent with my values. I wrote about what I wanted to prioritize in my life and what I dreamt of. I read these reflections once I was back home after every trip, and each time they would transport me to a different part of the world. Another journal entry from November 11, 2018, Hof, Iceland. Writing this from a moving bus because I'm too busy taking everything in. Watching the northern lights from my window last night and the stars, I can't describe it. I feel like I'm always being watched over by an otherworldly force. The Arctic waves touched my feet this morning. Can you believe it? So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? That's a verse from the Quran. Surah 55, Ayah 13. Fast forward to 2020. I read my entire journal back to back, but I was stuck. I was stuck in my job. I was stuck in my head. I was literally stuck in my apartment. The only solace was the entire human population was going through it together. And I didn't even have it bad. Finally, my mom told me that one day she saw the local bagel place open back up. They didn't open their doors fully, but we could now go and pick something up. Something that was not an experiment in my kitchen, finally. I stepped outside and took the bus to the city. I walked my favorite streets in the village, stood in front of store windows where no one had been in months. I saw a mask on the side of the street, proof that human life was still there. I even felt the bricks of the favorite building I always pass by on West Forth. I didn't realize it the first time, but my perception of New York had changed. It was no longer just home. It was my new place of reflection something I'd previously only done in my solo travels. Now I saw the city with fresh eyes, people watched intensely, and started taking myself out on more solo dates with my journal. I could no longer take a flight somewhere, but I could escape in my own city. I went to the same coffee shops and hole in the wall tie spots, but I ordered that thing on the menu that never looked good in pictures. It tasted like it was made in someone's grandma's kitchen. 
you know, we are encouraged to check things off our list, chase the next milestone and hustle till we make it. We're constantly in movement, but I've learned to pause and appreciate the in-between moments. Another Hi, I will be reading an excerpt from my piece, Friends and Friends, Your Anti-Muslim Racism is Showing. A lousy conversation that I think about too often took place at one of my previous jobs in downtown Manhattan. There was an elderly man who worked in my department, a little weird, but relatively friendly, constantly sharing stories that were TMI, a member of several liberal political groups, and white. On one unfortunate afternoon, he and I were heading out of the office around the same time. We exited leisurely, sharing a pleasant conversation and lingering outside the building to finish. When we were ready to separate, he smiled widely. You know what, Aisha? This was such a great conversation. You're very friendly. He seemed surprised. I smiled back, slightly confused. Oh, thanks, I guess. Had I come across as unfriendly to you before? No, no, it's just... He then proceeded to gesture vaguely towards my head, his eyes lingering on the scarf wrapped around my face. You being a Muslim woman and all, I didn't know if you'd be the type to talk to people and stuff. I could feel everything in my body come to a screeching halt. It was one of those, did they just say that bigoted thing? I'm not crazy or imagining it, am I? Moments. An instance of absolute yet highly controlled fury, lest the man on the opposite end see he had impacted me so sharply. In an even voice, trying to hide any slivers of anger, I asked, why would you think that? He went for the usual suspects. The media, ISIS, Afghanistan, blah, blah, blah. Although I had a train to catch, I stood there and politely deconstructed each of his arguments so he could walk away a little less ignorant than before. He certainly had rebuttals, but I could ultimately see a light smile materializing on his face. Him probably thinking, wow, I guess Muslim women aren't oppressed after all. Once satisfied, he thanked me for the conversation and went on his merry way. Meanwhile, I sat on the one-hour commute feeling empty inside. I sat at home feeling empty inside. And I went back to work the next day feeling empty inside. Here was the thing I hated the most, the thing that almost kept me from wearing a hijab in the first place. What is it about Muslim women wearing headscarves that makes Westerners view us as perpetually foreign, meek and submissive, and different from everyone else? These sentiments often result in divergent pathways. There's the blatantly racist, anti-Muslim violence resulting in hate crimes and attacks, and then there's the sleazier anti-Muslim rhetoric, often shrouded in the language of democracy, freedom, and equality, all purposely framed as antithetical to Islam. The latter especially allows for the festering of hypocritical, arrogant policies drenched in anti-Muslim sentiment. In April, the French Senate passed an amendment that would make it illegal for Muslim girls under the age of 18 to wear hijabs anywhere in public. Although this ban still needs approval from the French National Assembly in order to become a law, the move has already been fiercely denounced by leaders across the world as a blatant weaponization of so-called secularism, or laïcité, that explicitly targets France's Muslim population. This isn't new for France. The country has established an alarming pattern of reporting itself as a beacon of liberty, gender equality, and tolerance, while stripping Muslim women of the right to choose how they wish to live and dress in the same breath. This recent proposal builds on France's already existing hijab bans for women and girls in school. Thus, I don't waste my time responding to the hysterics of, does Islam oppress women anymore? You're a lost cause if you're still on that. Sorry. I'm more concerned about, do Western nations vilify Islam and Muslim women as an extension of their long legacies of imperialism, racism, and prejudice? Because the answer is yes, a resounding yes. For uppity Western nations like the US, the UK, and France that so often feel smugly superior to the rest of the world, it's not enough that they economically exploit black and brown countries, as well as their own indigenous populations, to greedily surplus their already heaping wealth. These nations then have the nerve to laud themselves for their supposed ideals, honestly believing they are God's gift to man, and use this tactfully constructed idea of their divine savior complex the essence to justify military occupations, resource extraction, violent crusades, 
racism, and the overall deceit and treachery vital to imperialism. I say us for Muslim and us for Westerner because I'm both. That's the other peculiar thing about this. There are millions of Muslim women who are from and or living in Western nations. The West and Islam are not these diametrically opposed, mutually exclusive or separate entities that are constantly in battle with each other, although pushing that false concept is high on the agenda for many. When hijab bans are passed in France, does anyone stop to ask French Muslim women if this is what they want? Have Muslim women in France been ripping off their hijabs in celebration? Definitely not. On the contrary, many Muslim students have been forced to stop wearing hijabs or drop out of university entirely just to keep their hijabs on. And several companies in France refuse to hire any Muslim women who wear hijab. When I think of myself a few years ago, I try imagining what might have occurred had someone forced me to wear a hijab when I had not started wearing it yet. I would feel crushed. When I think of myself present day, I also try imagining how it would feel if someone forced me to remove my hijab after I've now chosen to wear it and have been doing so for the last couple of years. Again, I would feel crushed. This French obsession with hijabs, it's weird, paternalistic, and spiteful. And most importantly, it has nothing to do with liberation and everything to do with asserting dominance over a religious community, fostering racism and demonization, and belittling women who dare to want different things than white feminists. Sarah Huck at Vice asks the million dollar question, she says, if feminism, reduced to its core, is the right for women to choose, how can institutions cite feminism as a reason for legislation which ultimately limits those choices? My biggest regret in the conversation with that older man was suppressing my anger from him. In retrospect, I wished I could have shown him how I felt. It seemed like I was needlessly protecting him from something when really he ought to have known how his misconceptions had upset me and he should have sat in that ugliness. I wish I made a big deal of the conversation and unsettled him. Maybe that would teach him that these types of microaggressions were and still are unacceptable. His remark had the same spirit as, wow, you're so well-spoken, or how do you reconcile being so outgoing with your religious beliefs, and other cringe-inducing comments that I never had to hear until I started wearing hijab. Are we ever going to just... I don't know, leave Muslim women alone? <laughs> Is that day near? Where do Western nations find the audacity to do all this? These are a smattering of questions I think about frequently. Yet, as I reach for my scarf every morning, maybe a viscose today, a pashmina tomorrow, a cotton blend for the weekend, I feel a deep peace that I still do not have the words to articulate, a groundedness that transcends even my own comprehension, a longing that's rooted at the center of my heart, and a rumbling certainty lodged in what I suppose is my soul. In these quiet moments to myself, I'm reminded that I know what freedom is, even if countries like France still do not. Thank you. I'll be reading my second piece for Open City about art spaces in Woodside and the Filipino American arts community. Woodside lives under the shadow of the seven trains elevated tracks. Every four minutes, I'll lean closer to the woman on the street selling to hot just to hear her shout out the price. Everyone raises their voice to feel heard as the subway rumbles overhead, the city's attempt to disrupt a conversation. One Saturday afternoon in June, old friends moved closer to one another and huddled in the triangle median along 69th Street and Roosevelt Avenue. Underneath the homemade construction of a bamboo house replicating a Filipino Baha'i Kubo or Nipah hut, Carl Orozco debuted his outdoor art installation in collaboration with local arts organizations, Little Manila Queens, The Laundromat Project, and Almosphere. The artist greeted friends from around New York City and welcomed passers-by along the avenue who were curious enough to stop and stare at the gathering of young creatives in masks, cut-out tank tops, and neon-colored hair. I hugged my friend who I hadn't seen since last summer and adjusted my social bearings as I was introduced to a new person for the first time in months. I was then immediately greeted with a photo release form, a concept I hadn't considered despite the years spent in front of webcam, as video cameras circulated around the art installation. Little Manila Queens runs in the tradition of Phil M Arts Organization in Woodside, working to have some government recognition. Woodside is a fitting space to invite and reunite the Filipino art and creative community. 
The nonprofit promotes the local Filipino-owned businesses along the Strip and has been advocating for the City Council to formally recognize the neighborhood along Roosevelt Avenue and 70th Street with long-standing landmarks like the Philam Store and Johnny Air Cargo as a designated Filipino community and to be known as the Little Manila. As I drive off the Grand Central Parkway exit ramp onto Roosevelt Avenue, I am greeted by the Evangelical Church, 69 Bar, and El Pollo Restaurant, long-running businesses in the majority Latino community. A group of young people hiked along the side streets in burgundy berets and their uniform varsity jackets, bearing the logo of the Guardian Angels. Choreographer and dancer Pastan Wakio arrived here more than 20 years ago to pursue her dance career. She found community at Filipino-American literary gatherings, like the Asian American Writers' Workshop, where she read texts that inspired the narratives of her choreography and movement. During the 90s, people were beginning to frequent Brooklyn for art spaces and experimentation. Paz was interested in finding a space of her own for artistic collaboration. Her husband found a raw warehouse in Woodside, formerly a button factory, for, with a for sale sign. The couple acquired the space 20 years ago and named it Topaz Arts. Paz recalls, the beginnings of Topaz were a space for ourselves and other artists. It feels the same as 20 years ago because this pace slows down from Manhattan, she says. In the beginning, neighbors asked what they intended on doing with the space. As time went on, Paz says that neighbors began to understand the artistic mission and eventually attended their gallery shows. Malini Srinivasan, a third generation Bharatanatyam artist specializing in the South Indian classical dance form, says, in Queens, we don't have that many art spaces and dance spaces. There are very few bookshops and green spaces outside of Flushing. Topaz has been an, art, an anchor for arts and culture, says Xenia Dente, founder of Little Manila, Queens. More arts and cultural spaces in Queens have closed down in the past few years, and maintaining a cultural atmosphere is almost a lost cause in a city dedicated to investing in developing higher income neighborhoods. Jed Marino understood the need for space and collaboration. He calls Bliss on Bliss Studio an alternative space where, where artists can meet in community with one another. The ceilings are low and its small rooms limit how far voices can travel. It's intimate. Moreno says of the humble gallery, there's a cross-cultural exchange and friendships forged among cultures. He attributes the space's longevity to the younger emerging artists who support it. In New York, a couple of bad shows and you're done, he says laughing. But over time, people started to meet each other and use Bliss on Bliss as a community space. Artist Jean Helendoni was invited to showcase her work as part of a group show. Her piece from 2018, Family Photo, featured woven banana leaves, iron-on prints, including a photo of the artist's family, embroidery on cotton and green canvas. It was important for me to see artists making work that expressed other facets of their identities beyond their cultural makeup, she wrote. The momentum to deliver a platform for this arts community led to the development of Nexi, an art collective for film artists in the Northeast. Its members want to bring in more artists into the fold. They're out there. They need the resources and platforms. Its co-founder, Francis Estrada says, in a way it's boiling and something's ready. Hopefully at some point, we just need cura curators more familiar with Southeast Asian artists and Filipino American artists. What's missing is the scholarship. This arts community has been self-sustaining as Estrada calls it. Generations of Phil M artists were carving out their own space. It has led to grassroots organizing and it's punk. As businesses began to reopen, so do echoes of threats of encroaching development in a more existential form. Even as the locals are still reeling from the pandemic, the rezoning plan on 63rd Street has led some local shop owners to choose not to renew, to renew their leases. The economic situation has real impacts on the art community in this neighborhood. A clear shift in demographics and capital in the borough has left struggling families and small businesses along Roosevelt Avenue wondering about the sustainability of living in Woodside. If Paz witnessed the mass move to Brooklyn and Williamsburg in particular for art spaces 20 years ago, then the city has spiked its investment in affluent areas of Queens today. Paz says that while the pandemic has strengthened solidarity, it has also exacerbated concern as a community. On that summer day in June, when we gathered at the median, it felt like nostalgia for that moment. 
the community organizations promoting social justice causes and awareness with flyers and representatives calling out the looming threat of what lies ahead. The neighborhood is rumbling and won't back down, but is that enough? In the same way that my friends and I hadn't anticipated not seeing each other in a year and a half, we had no idea how long we would be standing in the woodside that we saw that day. All around us, people were going about their day, moving from point A to B and living in the city that at times can deny them of their existence. Afterwards, my friends and I would disperse into the city. In Search of a Good Fight On the way out of Yemen Cafe in Brooklyn's Bay Ridge neighborhood, Rabal Tebani spotted a man leaning in the doorframe of an apartment building wearing a sweatshirt with the words, Yemen, we go hard, across the front. When she saw it, her eyes widened. I love that, she told him. We gotta get a picture of you in that. She glanced behind her at mayoral candidate Andrew Yang, who was nodding along to the words of a small business owner with whom he was speaking. It was a mild afternoon in mid-February, and the veteran community organizer was leading Yang on a walking tour of Bay Ridge. The event was less a survey of the neighborhood and more a walk down Fifth Avenue's industrial corridor, a stretch of some 30-odd blocks dominated by Arab and Muslim-owned businesses. El Taibani had pre-selected some of the Strip's most frequented establishments to visit, the famous Yemeni restaurant Yemen Cafe, the large Palestinian-owned grocery store Baladi, and the oldest Italian restaurant on the Strip, Gino's. This version of a Bay Ridge tour, several avenues up from the old money mansions dotting the waterfront on Shore Road, stood in stark contrast to the image most New Yorkers have of the neighborhood. Rather than visit a buttoned-up Republican enclave, Yang stepped out of his black SUV onto a block teeming with the kind of diversity that the city is known for, a place where the evidence of immigrant hustle crowds storefronts and spills onto the street. Draped in black peacoats and walking elbow to elbow down the sidewalk together, Yang and Al-Taibani made an amusing pair, the mayoral candidate exuding the cautious energy of a novice politician, pausing to choose his words the way one might pluck roses from a thorny bush, and the community organizer, whose carefree, unbroken speech resembled more of a bubbling brook, interrupted by bouts of high-pitched laughter. Most of the people who showed up for the tour came to hear about Yang's plans to support New York small businesses, of which Arab merchants are a large contingency. I came to meet Al-Taibani. I was aware of her long presence in the city's Arab and Muslim organizing spaces dating back to the weeks following 9-11. More recently, she's been involved in campaigns to elect Palestinian pastor Khodr al-Yatim to city council and Democratic politician Max Rose to Congress. A vocal opponent of the Muslim ban, Al-Taibani helped plan the 2017 Yemeni bodega boycott, one of the largest protests of Arab Americans in the city's recent history. The boycott, organized in response to Donald Trump's announcement of the travel ban, was an important moment for a community that historically has not played a major role in city politics. On that gray February day, thousands of Yemeni bodega owners closed their shops and poured into the streets in front of Brooklyn Borough Hall, demanding an end to the new policy. The community has been remarkably engaged ever since, and Al Taibani is one of the individuals leading the charge. She's not the leader you might expect. She does not shy away from posting photos of her evening glass of wine on social media or reminiscing about a time when her mother could walk the streets of Yemen without wearing a headscarf. I wondered how such an unconventional figure had managed to secure a prominent role organizing the Yemeni community. She's a person that's likable, explained Abdul Mubariz, the president of the Yemeni American Merchants Association, a city nonprofit that advocates on behalf of Yemeni small business owners. Even though she sometimes disagrees with the traditional factors that we come from, she seems to work around that. Mubada said that the community needs an organizer like Al Taibani, who reaches out to politicians and advocates for the interests of the Yemeni and Muslim communities as a whole. Perhaps the best example of this is her decision to offer Yang a tour of Bay Ridge in the first place. It remains to be seen whether Yang's proposed policies could actually benefit Yemeni New Yorkers in the long term. In fact, some experts have warned that their funding would eliminate important social welfare programs. However, Al Taibani's belief in them led her to break with many of the individuals she has spent the past five years organizing with. Early this year, as the city's nonprofit sector and left leaning PACs rallied behind city comptroller and career politician Scott Stringer, she had her eye on Yang. In his lack of political experience, an attribute often cited as his greatest weakness, she saw potential. 
A greener politician, she reasoned, would be less invested in maintaining the status quo and easier to pressure into passing progressive policies. Such a candidate might also be willing to consider the needs of a community that the city's politicians have long overlooked. As the tour took off, El Taibani's concern over this last point became abundantly clear. It's the best food in the world, she told Yang, as the owner of Yemen Cafe placed a stack of pillowy flatbread and a bubbling clay pot of lamb stew before him. But I guess I'm biased because I'm Yemeni, she said, laughing. And Bani was careful to introduce Yang to every Yemeni business owner and community organizer she invited to the event. There were many, showering each of them with compliments as she did. When a disgruntled spectator began raising his voice, accusing Yang of abandoning the city for his upstate home during the worst months of the pandemic, Ante Bani's smile snapped off. Respect the Yemeni community, she hissed at him repeatedly until the restaurant owner intervened to ask the man to leave. This reaction was not, Ante Bani later explained, due to her refusal to hear criticism of Yang as a political candidate. She emphasized that she had turned down offers to work for his campaign, preferring to keep her independence and ability to critique all candidates. Nonetheless, when he reached out to request a tour of Bay Ridge, Yang was the first political frontrunner to ever take an interest in meeting Yemenis on the campaign trail. al Bani considered the event a rare opportunity for a community members to have their voices heard. In her mind, this was their time. Hi, my name is Teresa Matthew, and I will be reading from my AAW piece about community patrolling in Flushing, Queens. Lily Dang, a Chinese-American computer science student at Queens College, still remembers the visceral reaction that prompted her to begin patrolling. She had seen a news story about an elderly Asian woman who had died after being attacked in a park, and the need to do something tangible unfurled within her. Dang had already heard about Main Street Patrol, a volunteer group created to watch over the streets of Flushing. The patrol, she hoped, would give her a way to protect potential victims who resembled the faces she knew and loved from dinner parties and family reunions. Dang filled out an application and signed up for the group's next available shift. Main Street Patrol was created in February by the actress and activist Teresa Tang. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Fear and anger seeking culpability have been directed, sometimes violently, at Asian Americans. In response, Chinatowns in Oakland, San Francisco, and Manhattan have seen residents and allies come together to create community patrols, keeping a lookout for anything from a racial slur to an act of violence. On an overcast Sunday in mid-April, Deng, who had recently been promoted from volunteer to team leader, drew her patrol members, Richie Liu and Suetha Vora, away from the plaza they had gathered and towards Main Street. Dang and Vora live in nearby neighborhoods in Queens, but Lou has lived in the area his whole life. In five days, he said, it'll be 30 years in Flushing. His mother immigrated from Taiwan in the early 80s. As we walk, he points out long-standing Flushing institutions and laments the migration of all the good Taiwanese bakeries to Jersey. Attacks on Asians have been happening for a long time, Lou says. There have been people who reported assaults or harassment and the police just shrugged. So you have tall Asian guys in the supermarket just walking their moms around. His mom has been asking him to accompany her to the grocery store for years. There has been a debate about the extent to which the level of violence is rising, whether the issue is simply getting mainstream attention for the first time. But safety, as it is experienced in one's own neighborhood, is not simply determined by data. A statistic is not what makes a grandmother or granddaughter afraid to step outside her front door. It cannot alter, let alone ameliorate, the fact that Asian Americans do not feel safe in the communities they have built. As the group passed an alley bordering a playground, Deng pointed out a spot where, during a previous shift, a thief had fled after stealing headphones from a sidewalk vendor. Her patrol had checked in with the vendor afterwards and asked if he wanted to file a police report, but the man had declined. He didn't think the police would be able to do anything, Deng explained. But she added that he had seemed reassured by their asking. The idea that people on the street were looking out for him was not quite the same as justice or retribution, but it was a reminder of a fact easily and ironically forgotten in a city of 8 million people. He was not alone. Community patrols are often lumped in with neighborhood watch associations in the kinds of Tony neighborhoods where the local police blotter suspiciously reports sightings of people of color doing ordinary things. In New York City, where ethnic enclaves have frequently found themselves both ignored and directly targeted by law enforcement, 
Community patrols have existed in some form since at least the 1960s. In 1968, the Harlem Tenants League invited youth patrols to keep guard over public housing projects. In the late 80s, Black Muslim men in bed patrolled the streets in an effort to combat open-air drug trafficking. Main Street Patrol is part of a long history of community patrolling in this nation and this city. Regardless of race, class, or creed, we come to believe that if we are not going to be protected, we must find a way to protect ourselves. Last year, the NYPD announced the creation of an Asian Hate Crimes Task Force, the first such departmental group concerning crimes that target a specific race. Lou believes that in an ideal world, the patrol would be able to cooperate with the police to make the streets safer, but he doesn't think either group has the necessary resources. Others in the community see no reason to applaud or cooperate with the task force. Street patrols are in line with conversations about de-escalation tactics to deal with stuff like this rather than cops being the first responders, Suetha Vora said. That April afternoon was her first time out with Main Street Patrol. She had heard about community patrolling in Oakland and looked to see if there was anything similar going on in Queens. Vora explained that she had come out to patrol because she had seen the hate crimes and she wanted to put her body somewhere it would be useful. A case is compelling for something more in line with Jane Jacobs' idea of eyes on the street, which the famous urbanist coined to evoke bustling public spaces and the people who care about what went on in them. The presence of real people who care about a neighborhood instead of police officers or CCTVs could help create a safer community. The effectiveness of community patrolling on crime or violence is difficult to measure, and Main Street Patrol does not disclose the number of incidents they encounter. Most patrols are unarmed, unable to do much more than attempt to scare a perpetrator off through strength in numbers or to document virulence online. Weapons would tip the scales into the territory of vigilantes and militias. For groups who wish to operate within the bounds of the law, there's a limit to what can be accomplished with a loudspeaker and a smartphone. Lou would like to see Main Street Patrol expand beyond its citizen watch group origins. Realistically, once COVID comes down, the next issue is dealing with the follow-up from right now, he said. You can see these volunteer groups in formative months when you see hate crimes happening, and you ask yourself, is it going to stick around next year when there are no more hate crimes, when you don't see elderly people getting assaulted? It's one thing, he said, to try and protect elders from bodily harm or death, but he wants to see the community rally around their lives and reckon with the poverty and loneliness that causes older members of the population to spend so much time on the streets. Lou said Main Street Patrol has given him the chance to see and engage with Flushing as more than just a bystander. It has offered him a palpable opportunity, he said, to find anyone who feels like they're being harassed or just needs translation, to actively participate in the community where he has lived his entire life. That palpable nature of patrolling is also what appeals to Deng. She had tried donating, petitioning, and attending rallies. Nothing else, she said, was the same as going out there and putting in time to look after a community. It's okay to be frustrated, but I want to make an impact, Deng said. For me, patrolling is a gateway to interact with the outside world. And the more time I spend doing it, I think we're not just protecting the community, but also each other. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so delighted to be here with all of you Open City Fellows. My name is Hannah Bay. And I'm a journalist and a nonfiction writer, and I was an Open City Fellow in 2019. So it is ex extra exciting for me to be here with you 2021 Fellows and Noelle, our wonderful leader. Um, so yeah, just thank you so much for joining and um, for giving your talents to the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, I really loved getting a chance to hear your pieces and it struck me that you all as New Yorkers, as writers have written these beautiful, eloquent love stories to um, love letters to New York City. And so I would love to hear about, you know, throughout the course of your reporting and writing throughout this fellowship, what were some of the things that surprised you about New York City? I think as I was researching some of my pieces in this post-pandemic world where everyone was quarantined. Um, initially, we all thought it was going to be really hard, and I'm, I'm sure there are challenges to being quarantined, but we all found either like creative workarounds or ways to still 
chat with community members, whether it's just, you know, stopping them, <laughs> or if it's people that we know that we could just tap into their networks and um, ask about their experiences. I think people, maybe just because of a lack of human interaction for so long, were so open to chatting and sharing their experiences that it did make uh, our work a little bit easier. Thank you so much. Um, my first two pieces were about um, Arab women organizers in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, and I think that when I set out to write at least the first piece, um, I was profiling a woman, Rabal Tebani, and I think I, I, I thought of her as this anomaly, really, um, sort of. Uh, you know, an Arab woman who is doing all this like really intense on the ground shoe leather organizing in the neighborhood. And I think one of the things that I learned, which, you know, was really wonderful to learn was that there are so many um, Arab and Muslim women in Bay Ridge and other parts of the city who have been doing this organizing for decades. And they're so involved and really are real, you know, essential sort of links in the um in these communities um, and that their work has just been really invaluable um, for a very long time. So I think that that was a, a wonderful kind of discovery. Thank you so much, Layla. Um, I think both of the pieces I've done so far have taught me kind of two separate things um, about the city. The first one, which was about community patrolling. I remember sort of going into it, not being quite sure. I was, I was sort of looking at a specific community patrol in Flushing and I wasn't sure if the composition would be mainly people from Flushing or people from the surrounding boroughs. And it was really kind of lovely to see that it did seem to be both. And it, it was also wonderful. You mentioned that these are sort of love letters to the city and just the fact that people from outside that one specific neighborhood were invested enough, you know, to say like this, I, I don't live in Flushing, but this is sort of part of my larger New York City community and, and I'm going to show up. Um, I thought that was really, really beautiful. Um, and also just what one of the people uh, that, that I interviewed said, who was saying, you know, it's not just enough to sort of care when people are getting attacked. We also really need to care about people's lives um, and sort of the lives as, as they're living them. And um, I've been sort of seeing Main Street Patrol do more sort of with the community. And that's that's also been really cool. Um, and then my other story has... I mean, I, I don't know. I think when you're a journalist, you expect nefariousness to sort of be lurking somewhere. But when I was um, writing this piece about India Home, which takes care of, of South Asian seniors and provides sort of activities and things for them, um, it was just really delightful how much all of the seniors loved the people who are working with them and were so appreciative. And um, it was, you know, that's such a, a real need, uh, not just in New York City, sort of all over the place for elders of, of every nationality. But I think definitely for, for South Asian seniors. And um, I, it was just, yeah, it was a really beautiful thing to see that kind of care given um, to this community. I, it, it felt like a privilege to witness that. That's lovely, Teresa. I think what um, surprised me the most or what I learned the most about New York was mostly from the other fellows and reading their work and how they went about their reporting, which taught me to go the extra mile with my reporting too and learning about their neighborhoods which are outside of my own and my circle so that really was amazing to track this whole year um i think with my piece um which is about the arts and culture community in woodside i had known these names and these organizations over the past couple of years um maybe even just familiar with them um but with this reporting, I was able to speak with the individuals who are active in the community. And I got to know more about their deeper feelings and frustrations and what they want to protect within the arts community. Um, I think artists like to be listened to. So I, it was great to speak with them. And with my other piece in Open, with the Open City, um, which was a profile of the performer Pochi Ranga Manis, which, um, I owe to Noelle for introducing me to her. It was really great to speak with her because I hadn't learned or heard about her before or her um, dance troupe. And I got to learn about the indigenous community and cultures from the Philippines. So that was a really eye-opening experience um, earlier this year too. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that, Jessica. Um, Aisha, Islam, have you answered yet? 
I haven't. And Hannah, your question is making me think about your your question and Jessica's answer are both making me think about like self awareness almost. Like I like I think something that I um I think what I was surprised by was like the fact that I was still being surprised a little bit by things in New York. Like I think when I when I leave New York, I'm always reminding people this is where I'm from. And like I'm such a like New York City is my entire personality. And I have so much pride and love for, like, the diversity of the city and everything that the city stands for. But I think, you know, going through this fellowship, and especially I'm thinking about my my third piece that I'm still writing, which is about a local um, city council election that took place in Jamaica, which is where I live. I was really surprised by some of the things that were coming out. Like, for example, with um, there's a lot of Bangladeshi politics, like, from the homeland of Bangladesh that really plays a role in how elections, local elections in Queens, New York, result in like how the outcome here so I think things like that like really niche things where it's like this is a city that I am so familiar with and I love this is like the ethnic community community that I'm part of but I think I was surprised to continue being surprised um about these little things that I was learning these little tidbits and little concepts and little behaviors and norms that I was learning about the community even even being from it even being like very like, this is where I'm from and saying that all the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, Noelle, you've been the editor of Open City for several years now, and I'm a reader and a former Fit fellow. So I've contributed to that side of the magazine. You know, working with this particular group of fellows, was there anything that you found surprising? This is the second batch of fellows and uh, during the pandemic. Uh, last year's batch really had a hard time adjusting because all of them are such people persons that, you know, even if you told them, okay, do not go into the community yet, it's not yet safe. Some of them even went to mosques I mean, to, to talk to people. And I, I told one of them, you know what, you might have endangered them. You know, you, 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 they may not be vaccinated. They are normally, you know, South Asian taxi drivers going to this mosque. And I don't think you are, all, you are uh, vaccinated yet two right uh, you, you're not yet vaccinated so i said oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry but you know they are so you know the fellows from last year they'll just hang out in in coffee shops and start chatting up people we, we call them the mayors of of flushing the mayor of jackson heights they're so you know so so at ease talking to people so it was really very very hard for them to and i think uh one one of one of the main reasons that they that they joined the fellowship was that because they wanted to actually go to the neighborhoods, you know, uh, be immersed in the neighborhood, which the pandemic did not allow. Uh, I think this batch uh, already had a year under their belt uh, of, of reporting to, uh, during the pandemic, so I think this batch was able to adjust more easily than the than the previous batch although i know uh i know it's still hard i mean not being able to you, you are supposed to cover a neighborhood and then you cannot go to the neighborhoods i mean that's tough that's that's really tough but um i guess um as a group actually i would like to to know more about you know how did the group help you in a way um write your stories uh given the pandemic given the limitations of the pandemic did the fellowship did the fellows group offer you know a fellowship uh, a writer's community for you yeah i would i would love to hear from you know whoever wants to answer that um you know how this cohort of five incredible writers how you kind of fed off of each other and how you were able to care for each other and influence each other's writing I mean, I think we we were talking about this a little bit before this call started, but I think it's exactly what you just said, Hannah. It's like these incredible writers who are caring for each other and reading each other's work and reviewing it. I think that really made the difference for me versus, you know, writing in isolation, which I think it's, it's kind of hard to do in general, but I think even more so in a pandemic. Um, but I think that really, really made a difference for me. Like, I still think about when we had our very, very first editorial meeting and we were reading each other's work and give each other's feedback. I remember leaving that meeting so just like uplifted like I remember feeling like wow like they are so amazing and I'm so obsessed with all of them like I was heart eyes while reading all their pieces and um 
you know, scribbling down all their feedback. And I think that was what made it feel like a communal process. Like we're all doing this together. We're all learning from each other. We're all leading from each other. Um, so, so I think to me, that was like a really special part of this fellowship. And um, it's one that, you know, it's an aspect that I hope we all continue. And I, and I know we will. Thank you, Aisha. That's beautiful. Anyone else want to address that? Jessica? Yeah, yeah. I think you can only be so lucky when it comes to being with a group of people who you didn't know before and you're put together and you're supposed to (laughs) gel and mesh. And I think we have really great chemistry since the first workshop that we had. Um, I mean, I know just personally speaking, being in spaces where it's not always comfortable to edit or workshop pieces, but with this group um, and with the Asian American Writers Workshop, it was just really comfortable being able to share your thoughts about your pieces and being edited and learning from other the other fellows reporting styles. So yeah, and everyone's just so great. <laughs> like ever, keeping the group chat going, everyone can imagine. <laughs> Yes, totally. We still have our uh, WhatsApp group from my fellowship in 2019 still active, which is really wonderful. And I've been able to see some people um, who are still in New York City um, from my fellowship class too during the pandemic. You know, just reading all of your pieces, um, you meet people from so many different walks of life. But as the writers of these pieces, I, I feel like you know, what something that Teresa said really struck me and that it's not this adversarial relationship that you're having with your sources, which is more common in, you know, like strict journalism. But I got such a sense of care from all of your pieces, um, despite all of the, you know, political differences, different walks of life that you were describing in your pieces. Um, So I would love to hear from some of you about, you know, what that feeling was like to to go into a community that, or to be a part of a community and write about it and um, to do it from a place of care and not from a place of like extraction, you know, which is so common in a lot of uh, nonfiction. I, I think for me, it was um, really encouraging, interesting to kind of um, hear people's surprise at being asked the questions that I was asking them and being asked to tell their stories. I think that it was pretty clear to me that a lot of the people I spoke with um, had never been asked to tell their stories or or made to feel that their stories were important at all. Um, I remember one woman who I spoke with saying, oh my God, it's been 20 years and I've never, ever been asked about this sort of uh, one of the biggest things that ever happened to me. Right. And, and so, um, I think, you know, there's something obviously really uplifting about being able to tell stories that you feel are important because they are, you know, they belong to your community and then sort of being the facilitator of those stories and being sort of the channel through which they get to see the light. Um, and and then you know almost to sort of touch on your previous question i'd never done anything like that before um and so i think i entered the experience with a, a certain level of insecurity and sort of am i doing this right but then um found a lot of encouragement and uh my fellow fellows um who who truly are you know you know now i consider great friends um so i think overall that that was a, an experience that i hope to uh, return to again someday Thank you, Layla. Anyone else? Yeah, I think looking at my first two pieces, the first story was about Asian Americans that were impacted by the pandemic and how employment rates suffered and the kinds of activism and social projects people were people were able to take on. And I think those interviews were very different from my second piece which was about my mom. (laughs) And I think that was harder to some extent. The care came naturally, but just buying that fine line of how much can you share about personal relationships without offending someone without or with specific attention to who might be reading. And if they are reading this piece, how are they feeling? Um, was a very interesting dynamic that I'd never had to think about before. I, I The story was about my mom's divorce journey 
and her experience as a South Asian woman after her divorce in Jackson Heights. Um, and it talked about her, her treatment from other members of the community who she still interacts with till this day. So I had to really just sit her down at one point and ask her, are you comfortable sharing all of this? And she's just a very brave woman. And she said, yeah, like I need to tell my story for all of those that can't. So I think it was a really interesting um, place to navigate. And what a special experience to be able to really dig into your mom's story like that, Aisha. It's amazing. All right. Well, let's move on to our next question. Um, so it strikes me that as a group, you all come from uh, different career paths. There are some of you who are journalists, some of you work in policy and nonprofits and advocacy, and obviously you're all really brilliant writers. Um, and so I wanted to hear about like how your different types of experience were able to inform the way that you were able to read each other's pieces and um, help shape each other's work, you know, in giving feedback. Let's start with Teresa, if you, if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, well, I think one of the things that sticks out, I guess it's sort of there, there are two things that stick out to me a little bit. Um, the first one is, I think it was really nice for all of us to know, and this is perhaps regardless of background, but I just, I remember Noelle saying um, before we started the fellowship, you know, the pieces we do, they're read by, by everybody. And so people will kind of give suggestions and, and let you know. And I think that also provides like a sense of security because you are dealing with stories that are sensitive that touch on Asian American communities that you might not your, that you might not be a part of yourself. Um, and so I sort of knew, okay, you know, at least it has been read by other people who are coming at it from the same vantage point of like sensitivity and, and empathy and care. And I think that is really important. I think when you work in a newsroom, um, you know, usually people are coming at it from sort of different vantage points. And so I, I thought that was, that was really nice. It was sort of all of us were kind of looking at it from this, from, a, from, the, from the vantage point of like, well, how are we speaking about the community carefully and empathetically? Um, and so that, that was really just nice. It was nice to have that sort of support system. Um, and then I think Layla touched on this earlier, but also um, I was just thinking of when you were in, you were talking about, um, your oral history and you were like, yeah, I don't know. And, and, you know, is this good? And all of us were like, of course this is good. Like, this is brilliant. Like this is, this is such a, a great piece. And um, I think as I move into my, my third story, it sort of opened my mind up to be like, oh yeah, like I should also experiment, you know, this is a place where we should do that. Um, and I think, yeah, the fact that, you know, we do come from these different backgrounds sort of en en enriches that perspective and also um, helps to create that kind of support. That's awesome. Anyone else? Yeah. So that's an interesting question because my background is in journalism and my education is in journalism. And I think what was great about this fellowship was, and Noel really encouraged us to experiment with form and style. So not necessarily sticking to a journalistic um, format, but I'm able to write more essayistic or in first person in almost a blog format for Open City. And even reading the, um, the other fellows work throughout the process, it also helped me to learn how to use first person a little bit more after a few years of not doing so. Um, so yeah, I think it helped me creatively. Um, so m almost moving away from my, my background and my job into a more creative sense, yeah. Yeah, I really loved being able to read those first person perspectives and to, to see all of you stretching in all these really interesting ways. Um, Aisha, I, I think you were unmuting yourself. I wanna hear what you have to say. Yeah, I think this is, I, I agree. This is such a great question. I feel like I think about this a lot, like on the job, um, but I, I, like I mentioned, I work in the policy space and I, I actually feel like a lot of my policy background has been super relevant to me as like a writer, as a storyteller, I think, um, with policy work, I think a lot of it, a lot of the experience has to do with kind of going behind the scenes, um, trying to see how systems impact individuals, learning or trying to learn how to ask the right questions, um, trying to, like, trying to understand how to break things down for different audiences. So I feel like a lot of that is, like, super, super relevant to me in, like, this more creative writing role. Um, and I think the other thing that was mentioned that was definitely resonating with me was, I think there's, 
both in the policy space and in this space, like open city, I think I have a lot of concern about like, am I authentically doing something, creating something that is both reflective of people in the community and with people in the community. And I think that's something that I'm constantly like trying to check with myself again, both in the policy space and in this space. And um, I think that kind of like North star question is something that I take with me a lot everywhere. Um, So I think that's like one of the ways that, it feels very like dual usage in, in all the spaces that I go. I love it. It's so interesting to hear about like how you're all able to kind of borrow from these different parts of your brains and experiences and hearts uh, and bring them into your writing in different forms. It's very cool. And just being able to read your work and to very much see your distinctive voices shine through. Um, I'm so glad that you had this chance to, to nurture those unique qualities through your writing. Um, so I think we're kind of nearing the end of our time here, but I would love to hear about who you consider your writing teachers or what you consider your writing teachers, because these can be, you know, not people, they can be books, um, or people that you've learned from only through their books or whether you've met them in person or, um, or, you know, uh, learn from them directly. So I would just love to hear about your experiences um, with various teachers and um, yeah. I'll be the first to say that because I don't come from a traditional writing background, I don't really read as much as I should to have as many reading teachers or writing teachers as I should. Um, That being said, yes, I do workshops and little prompts here and there, and that's always fun. But I think for me, what really drew me towards writing at a really early age was just, and I know most people say this, is just an escape from their lives. And I know (laughs) at the age of nine, that probably sounds a little intense. But I think where I was in my childhood, going through my parents' divorce, a school counselor actually had suggested journaling to me and I had taken that to heart and she also said keep records of them date them and make sure you have like journals for every year and she made it almost seem like homework but I actually have journals from the fourth grade onwards for every single year of my life and it's so fascinating for me to just look at the way my thought process has evolved through the years a lot of it was just like really bad fiction writing about like two people in love but it has since then evolved um and I think the way I've reflected on life also comes through and that practice of writing every other day or even every week um has helped me still like renew this or retain this interest in writing thank you Aisha that's wonderful to hear I also was a big journaler when I was young and that actually featured in one of my open city pieces. So it's cool to hear about your experience too. Um, I feel like so much of it is, is just, gosh, like reading. Um, I think even if, even, I mean, I, I, I do work in journalism, but it's so hard to find a mentor, I think, especially if you don't work in, in kind of a traditional, like, um, or if you hadn't had sort of the most traditional career in it. Um, so I, I, yeah, I just feel like so much of it is um, latching on to writers that I like and just like reading them um, and sort of trying to learn everything I can from their sentences. And one thing that's been really beautiful about um, the Asian American Writers Workshop is some of those people, we've gotten to speak to them. Like, and, and that has just been amazing. Like Magaya Mishan, who I've been reading for years. Um, it, was, it was so cool to get to talk to her and hear about, you know, some of her process and, and how she got started in this. Um, and I, I always think that there's some writers who you read and you just sort of think, oh my gosh, I can never do anything like this. So I'm just going to step away from my laptop and like become a baker in Amsterdam, not based on a real life example. And then there are other writers who I feel, I don't know, you read and you're so inspired that you, that, that inspi- inspires you to write. And I, I can't quite explain like what the difference is or, or, or sort of where the line lies between those two. But um, I think for me, two of those people, one of them is one of my best friends, Carlina Duan, who is a, is a poet um, and, and a beautiful Asian American writer. And I feel like whenever I read her work, either her nonfiction or her poetry, um, I, it always makes me feel like, oh, you know, yeah, that's so beautiful. Like, I, I, I want to try that. Um, 
And I think, I think it's, it's sort of good. It's sort of good to have both. And it's really beautiful to be able to lean on your friends as well in that way to, to really inspire you. Thank you, Teresa. Anyone else? So speaking of like creative writing, I think my, a lot of my creative writing just comes from feeling or is motivated by feeling. So if, um, whether it's anger or happiness or watching a really moving movie or uh, painting, it sort of triggers the pen a little bit. Um, so that's mainly been the teacher for me, um, but also motivated by my friends and my best friends and their writing and poetry. Um, like reading everyone else's work has been really powerful in how I approach my writing now too. Um, also just as writing as a teacher, I have this thick anthology called Writing the City, um, compiled, compiled by Philip Lope, who's great. Um, and it's basically just essays about the city. So before I would write any of my pieces for Open City, I was like, let me just read real quick how Jane Jacobs writes about 14th Street. And then I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's how she does it. Let me try doing it my way. So that's been really helpful. That's such a cool technique, Jessica. I feel like every Open City Fellow should uh, try and do some version of that. That's so cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I would echo what everyone else has said and and sort of just to hop on to what Jess, Jessica was just saying. Um, I think like the streets and the subway <laughs> um, are my teachers, in addition to all the long form that I'm constantly reading and trying to, you know, imitate to some degree. Uh, I'm really interested in just regular human speech. Um, when I was younger, I used to think that um, I needed to have like an encyclopedic knowledge of the English language and use big complicated words and insert really juicy images. Um, but sometimes the most incredible, you know, uh, things that are just little snippets that you hear as you're walking, oh, there used to be an amazing Spanish restaurant here, you know, just like little things that you hear as you're walking down the street. Sometimes I have a little note on my phone and I'm just constantly scribbling into it because there's so much gold um, in, in New York all the time, everywhere. Um, and so I started caring a little bit less about um, the fancy dialogue or the, the, the fancy, sorry, not dialogue, the fancy language and um, trying more to sort of write in the voice of the people I was trying to represent um, trying to tell their stories. Um, and so I would say that they are probably my primary teachers. I love it, Layla. Any other responses? Yeah, Aisha? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, seriously, like everything that everyone is saying is so resonating with me. And I'm especially thinking about, I think if Jessica, you were talking about this, but like writing being like this emotionally driven thing, that is like speaks to me on so many levels because I think so much of it really is tied to my like emotional state and like my perspective on something. And um, I think also it's it's so driven by kind of also what like, like Layla was saying, like the everyday moments, like these slices of life, just like random things, everyday normal things that happen, things that you observe. I think a lot of that is part of it. Um, I also think that, um, I don't know, I also like so much to what Teresa said about being inspired by writers and you know again like we've been able to speak with such amazing people um one of the ones that I coming into Open City one of my favorites was Wajah Ali, and then we got to he came to speak with us and I just think he's so funny and iconic and such a good writer so it's amazing to see people like that but I also even think like um I think there's a lot of imposter syndrome in this space and sometimes I'm like am I even good at this like what, what am I doing here like I feel like I have that moment like once a week and um sometimes it this maybe sounds like terrible and I'm actually honestly thinking more about my, cause I also do screenwriting in my own time. I'm thinking of this kind of in the screenwriting sense. Like sometimes it just takes like a really bad movie to be like, Oh, right. Like I can do better than this. Or, or like, I, there's no reason why, like, you know, this rich white person who just happened to have the funding to put a movie together. Like there's no reason that why I couldn't do that. And I think I could do that. And sometimes Again, maybe that's not like the best approach, <laughs> but sometimes I feel like it is kind of that, like it is kind of like, especially when I go there, when I'm like, I'm clearly so terrible at this. I feel like sometimes I need like a little bit of reminding myself that there's like a reason that I'm here, reminding myself that like 
not everything I write is going to be the most beautiful thing ever. And that's like part of the whole process and like always growing, always trying to be better. Um, so I think it is like the practice of writing that I feel like is a good teacher. I think it's also like everyone said, like the life moments, the different people in your life, the people that you look, you look up to. Um, I think all of that in like a jumbled way is kind of like a teacher slash inspiration for me when I'm writing. That's so great. And I'm so glad that you have these ways of like tapping into a, a, a confidence that you can find, you know, when, when you're starting from a place of, of feeling insecure, because I think every single one of us has been there and, and knows that feeling very well. Well, everyone, thank you so much for sharing so much of your genius with this audience, um, with me and Noel and um, the Asian American Writers Workshop. I, I can see that there is just so much wonderful community among all of you. And I hope that, you know, as your writing careers continue, that you can be kind of peer mentors to each other and, and keep building each other up and, um, you know, kind of cross pollinating each other's minds. Um, and hopefully as this pandemic gets to a point where we can meet more in person, like that, you can get to know so many more of the people who have been involved in Asian American Writers Workshop and built this community over the past 30 years. Um, and we, we are so lucky to have you as part of it as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you yeah. so much, Hannah.